Um, I'm going to tell you uh, the true story today. By the way, it's not on the news. I didn't notice it on the news today. But uh, 2,000 years ago, a man who said he came down from heaven, Jesus Christ, he was considered a blasphemer because he said that he was the son of God. They said, uh, you know, he was talking about Abraham, and they said, how can you even talk about Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. Well, he told them in John 8, he said, before Abraham was, I am. That got him real happy. They didn't come to his church. In fact, they wanted to kill him for that. But the fact is, is you can't, he couldn't help but testify who he is. And so uh, a week ago, uh, 2,000 years ago, but a week ago, last Sunday, he comes into Jerusalem riding a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah. And basically at that point, everything's looking good. All the disciples are happy. People are putting palm trees or cutting off palm branches, laying their clothes in the, in the way. And uh, sure enough, he sends up to this guy and says, tell the Lord, tell them the Lord has need of it. He gives them the donkey and her colt. And uh, Jesus rides in to Jerusalem. Everything's looking real good until Jesus decides to go to church. He goes into the temple. And they're, when, when they say they were selling merchandise, it wasn't like they had a bookstore on the side. It was what they were doing was is they were overcharging people, they were manipulating the people, and they'd made it a merchandise issue instead of giving an offering from their hearts as was written in the law of Moses. So Jesus was totally fed up. He had done that at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 2, and he's doing it again at the end of his ministry. Ah, I wonder if he did it at the beginning of his ministry, if he's going to do it before he comes and cleans his house. Oh, I wonder... I wonder if that's why it's in the Bible, that there's coming a great house cleaning from the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it's coming. But anyway, he goes in, and that kind of upsets him. They say, well, you know, where do you get your authority to do this? He said, well, I'll, I'll ask you one question. John, was John's authority from heaven or of men? They said, oh, boy, that's a trick question. If we say it's from heaven, then they'll say, why weren't you baptized by John? If we say of men, the people might get mad at us because they all consider John a prophet. They said, we don't know. He said, I won't tell you either. But the obvious answer is my authority, Jesus would have said, of course, my authority comes from heaven. So with that heavenly authority, he went in and taught for a few days and so forth, taught about the end times, taught about the ten wise, the ten fool, or the five foolish and five uh, wise um, uh, virgins and all of that. And then um, things start to really wrap up where they are going to now arrest him. The Jews have finally got the plot. They've got Judas now has been now possessed of Satan. The scripture says Satan entered him and he knows exactly where Jesus is going to go hang out with his disciples. So he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. The whole thing happens where they arrest Jesus. They take him. They beat him and interrogate him most of the night, put him in the hands of these violent, tough Roman soldiers, and they mock him, strip him, and then beat him and take him to Pilate and to the high priest and all that. And this was during the time when the priests were looking for the perfect Passover lamb. And here God puts him right before them, and they reject him. So Jesus Christ goes on, and we'll put up now, um, John, or excuse me, Matthew 27, if you can up there, 27, 45 through 50. So here Jesus, according to Hebrews 2, 9, is now going to taste death for mankind. If you remember in the garden, of Getz, or in the garden with Adam and Eve, he said, the day that you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that day you will surely die. But according to Romans 3.25, it says that God in his forbearance withheld that full and total judgment that mankind would be fully and totally dead to God and God himself would, as it were, be totally alienated. God set up a system whereby through the Mosaic law and all of that, that he could walk with men as they came under the blood of lambs and goats. But we know that that is not able to cleanse the conscience from works that lead to death, that we may serve the living God. So Jesus now is coming, are you ready, as the last Adam. The first Adam was natural of the earth. He was a living soul. The last Adam is the Christ from heaven. He is a life-giving spirit. Therefore, and I'll show you in a few minutes, that mankind up to this very day there are two species of what we call mankind 
technically only one uh, is really mankind. The other one, other ones are empowered by the supernatural divine nature having been born from above by the power of the Holy Spirit. They're in Christ. Everyone who isn't a believer in Jesus is in Adam. So Jesus is on the cross, and now he's going to take the full judgment and wrath of God on the cross for mankind. He's going to taste death, Hebrews 2.9, for all men. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land, which obviously is a sign, obviously. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just leave that there for a moment. You have to understand now that the disciples, you know, they're just thinking just a, a few days ago, everybody was rejoicing. They were throwing things down in the streets and so forth. Then he goes in and confronts the religious order, and that stirs up everything. And God will do that at times, even today. But what happens is here is all of a sudden things go from bad to absolutely the worst nightmare that anybody could imagine. Mary, his mother, is standing there. How that woman made it through, I will never know. What, how she didn't just literally have a heart attack and die, I have no idea how Mary. The Bible says they stripped him naked, they plucked his beard, they had beaten him so he wasn't even uh, look like a, a, a person. If you read the last two ver three verses of Isaiah 52, then go into 53, it explains all of that. It says here now he is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is exactly what it says in Hebrews 2.9, that he would taste death for all men. The judgment that came upon Adam and Eve was held back, held back, though mankind, until they're born again, are all in Adam. Those who were born again enter into Jesus. Two different races on the earth. It's not about skin color. It's whether you're in Adam or in Jesus. So let's go a little farther here. When some of them standing there heard this, they said he's, he's uh, calling for Elijah. Uh, immediately one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with wine and vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Uh, the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Now at this point, I mean Mary, all of them, all they heard was, my God, my God, where have you forsaken me? You talk about doubt. You talk about being crushed in their heart. You think about their world falling apart. This was mega, mega doses, overwhelming to them. Mary's walking away. You know, the women who love Jesus and followed him, the disciples are all overwhelmed. They don't know what to think. They don't know what to do. It's just darkness. The worst thing ever could have happened. They didn't know what was going on. Well, we do know what happened eventually was is three days later, they have buried him, of course. Joseph of Arimathea comes and gets his um, body, and he wraps him in all of that, put him in the tomb. You all know the story. There's an earthquake. What happens? Some of the Old Testament saints come out of their graves and start walking into the city after him, after his resurrection. You think that would have been a good evangelistic tool, you know? I mean, it would have, would have made me a believer, that's for sure. Excuse me? Your name is Abraham? Oh, dear God. And Jeremiah's over there? Oh, my gosh, honey, I got, I got to go home and get my kids, you know. This is, this is amazing. And so when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So now he's dead. They, they're just totally overwhelmed. But what happens is, is, is that Mary, she goes to the tomb, and she looks in, and there's nobody there in it. So she says, she finds these angels, they say, where where have you taken him? I want to go find my Lord. Where have you taken him? I'll, I'll, I'll go take care of him. And uh, a little bit later, Jesus, or she walks away, and all of a sudden, uh, Jesus says, Mary, she turns around. Oh, my God, it's you. So she grabs him, the Scripture says, and he says, don't touch me, don't hold on to me. I haven't yet ascended to my Father. Scripture says she thought he was the gardener. I mean, it wasn't like he was all dressed up. He had been through literal hell, demonic forces, 
dying on the cross, forsaken by God. So she's totally overwhelmed. She goes and gets Peter and John. They run in, find out it's, he's not there. They don't know what to do. And then later, of course, the Lord starts to appear to them. And all of a sudden it says, and then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. I mean, you got to realize they probably hadn't been sleeping. They went through the worst nightmare that a human being could possibly endure. Someone who they loved, devoted themselves to, said that we'll die with you. All of them said that. They were fully committed to him. And to see this darkness come, that's what Jesus said to Pilate. He said, now is the hour of darkness. It's your time where darkness rules. So there are these things. And what looked to be absolutely the worst, Jesus was able to be raised from the dead by the glory of God. He actually takes David and all the prophets into heaven with him. You know, Acts, or excuse me, Psalm 68 and others tell this. But this was such a radical event. Now all Jerusalem is getting stirred up again. There was some lies spread that his disciples came and stole away his body. Those guys didn't have the guts to do anything, man. You know, oh, sure, yeah, oh, yeah, they were... You know, no, they were they were hiding behind doors and they were scared out of their wits. They thought they were going to be killed next. It looked like it was all over. What they did to him, I guess, were next. There was no there was. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the angels come to him and said, "Um, listen, you need to go to Galilee. He's going to meet you up there, just like he said. So, I mean, you can tell, man, they're going through an, an amazing trial, you know, overwhelmed. And he appears to them and so forth and so on. Then it says some of them at the end of Mark 16, it says some of them even doubted. It's like, who is doubting his? He's there. He's right there. And and it says he rebukes them for their hardness of heart and unbelief. And then he says, um, hey, by the way, go into all the world. (laughs) You know, it's just amazing story. Right. And uh, uh, I want you to see this. Let's go to um, Romans uh, 1, 4, Romans 1, 4. um, It says who through the spirit was appointed the Son of God in power by His what? Resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. If there is no resurrection, then we are of all men most miserable, Paul said. Why? Because without a resurrection, let's go to 1 Corinthians um, 15, 21 and 22. Uh, This shows you what I was alluding to earlier, that you're either in Adam or you're in Jesus. You're either... In the old human being that is under the judgment of God because of Adam and Eve, the mother and father of the human race, you're either still in them or you've been born again from above and you're put inside God, inside Jesus by the Father. So it says since death came through a man, that is Adam, there had to be a resurrection or the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, obviously Jesus. As in Adam, all what? Die. So in Christ, all are what? Made alive. So there you see it. This is such an incredible verse, this one particularly. It says that you'll see in just a few minutes further down in this, uh, in this uh, story, in this chapter. But I want you to get this. I want this to sink down into your heart. You live on a planet in the universe where maybe 75 to 85, 80% of the people live are a different race than you are. You say, well, yeah, I know I'm white or I'm Hispanic or I'm Asian, I'm African American, I'm European descent. I'm not talking about that at all. We're talking about you're either in Adam, the natural man, or you've been born from above and you are in Christ. There's no other way. There's only two kingdoms, Colossians 1:13. We have been delivered or translated out of the dominion of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we are having redemption. There are those who are the unredeemed and those who are the redeemed, the children of the day and the children of the night. Now, let's go down to verse 45 through 50. I want you guys to see this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through actually 49. Yeah, so it is written the first man, became Adam, became what? A living what? A living being. That's a good translation. And the last Adam, a what? 
life-giving spirit. This is very important because Jesus said in John 20, uh, uh, 4, 24, God is spirit. He was talking to the woman from Samaria and saying, you know, you must learn to worship God in spirit and in truth. That is to know the truth about God. And you need to actually be born again and your spirit needs to be imparted eternal life so that you can worship from your spirit because God is spirit and he wants his children to worship him in spirit and in truth. Can we just go quickly to John 3? Um, I think I gave you uh, 5 and 6. I want to just make this very clear here. It says, Jesus is saying that you've got to be born again. Al, can you adjust this thing up here? Where's Al? Did he leave? Well, go get him. Tell him he has to adjust this. I told him not to leave. I want that adjusted. It's too, hot, uh, too cold in here. Now, Jesus answered and said, watch this now. Verily, verily, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of what? Water and the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must impart to your spirit the life of God because God is Spirit and His children must be spiritually alive by the power of His Spirit. Amen. You understand? Are you with me? So when you're born again, you are born again by the impartation of eternal life coming to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. Therefore, it's so important that Jesus be what? He be a life-giving spirit. We don't want to be a living soul. We already are, and we're dead in Adam. But we want to be born from above. So Jesus is a life-giving spirit. When he went up to heaven, he said, listen, it's better that I go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. What does he do? He enters into you and imparts the very life of God and births your spirit. And now you are born of God. Can we put down, I gave you Romans 8.16. Let's go there. And then we'll go back to 1 Corinthians again. But I want you to see this. This is very important in Romans 16. The Spirit testifies with what? Our what? Spirit. That we are what? God's children. Why? Because God who is Spirit must communicate with a Spirit that's alive. You are born again by the power of God. And the Holy Spirit testifies to your Spirit. Hey, you may have messed up. You don't understand all this. But your spirit is going to feel the testimony of God's spirit telling you you're a child of God. You believe in Jesus. He's going to see you through. You're, you, know, you may have messed up or you may be having a great day. Whatever. God eternally is in love with you. He's connected you to his very self. That's what we're talking about here. So there you go. So we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 14 or uh, verse uh, 45 again. I want you to see this. So it says, as it is written, the first ad, man became a living being. There it is. Human being. Great. The last Adam, he's totally different. He's going to give you the life of God that is eternal. But he cannot put it in your soul or in your body. He's got to give you a spirit. You must be born again. So his spirit will impart to you spiritual life and create within you a spirit. Yes, the life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. After that, the spiritual. So you were born once by your mother and father coming into this world, and you were natural. Now, when you come to the Lord, you are being born from above by the power of the Spirit. The first man was of the what? Earth, earth or dust, the dust of the earth. The first man, Adam, was created out of the dust of the earth. Well, that's what your body came from, most of it, okay? But now that you're born again, uh-oh, the second man is what? Of heaven, okay? So something of heaven. Huh. As was the earthy man, so are those who are of the earth. But now you're not only of the earth. You have a physical body, all right. But as the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. Now watch this. Did I give you the last verse? And just as we had born the what? image of the earthly man we shall also bear the what image of the heavenly man now oh pastor what's this mean well it means this 
that you have the ability to receive from heaven. In fact, Philippians 2 or 3.20 says you're a citizen of heaven. In fact, it says when Christ was raised from the dead, we were in Christ and we were raised with him, seated with him in the heavenly places. What? Yes, exactly. Now, a lot of this I know is rather mysterious to people. I mean, you know, we're not even sure if we accept angels anymore, although they're all over the Bible. You know, you think, I mean, uh, is God, can I see God? According to the, you know, the purity of your heart, you can see God, perceive God. He's given you a new heart so that you can know him and love him. But here, here's the bottom line. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that causes you to have the ability to be born from above because he destroyed the power of death and he brought eternal life from heaven and imparted it to you when you believed in him. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, I'll go just a little bit more here. There was um, in uh, Ephesians 1.19. It says in Ephesians 1.19, it says that this power that raised Christ for the de- from the dead is what? For us and his incomparably great power, what? His incomparably great power, what? For, for us. Oh, so resurrection power is for you. It was for him, but now he's resurrected. Besides, he was the resurrection and the life. That's just normal for Jesus. He only emptied himself when he came down as a man. But he's full of resurrection power and always was before the creation of the world. Now, But he's got this resurrection power that is more powerful than the last enemy, which is death. Jesus has it. Okay? But now it's for you. Oh, for what? Well, to believe when you can't believe. To be able to hold on when you can't hold on. To be able to love when you don't feel like it. There's resurrection power when things are going sour. Oh, that's awesome, isn't it? Okay. Someone canonize that, put my name next to it. Yeah, yeah, you know, they can't, no one can say that now without my approval. That's the world we live in, forget it. Okay, yeah, turn, uh, turn uh, this heat up here. So, uh, the man in the back. Now, watch this very carefully. And his, incompar- his incomparably great power, it's for us who believe. Well, what is it? That power is the same as the mighty strength that he used when he raised Christ from the dead. That's the whole point. What I'm saying to you is this. You must be born by the power of the Holy Spirit. You must have your spirit be born again and imparted life by the person of the Holy Spirit. We're not talk, we are not, I am not religious. I am not a religious guy. I don't like religion because religion is a negative to anybody that, he, that knows what it really is. It's just people talking about maybe God, that sounds good, but it's a relationship. Christianity is, is a family affair, not a list of rules and regulations. Christianity is, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and you were by nature the children of wrath. But God sent His Son from heaven, perfect, never sinned, filled with love and power, and He took upon Him the full brunt of the evil on this world system. And God put it all on Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin became sin that we might be in the process of becoming the righteousness of God in Him. The most important thing is, first, can we down 1 Corinthians 15.1-4? I don't think I gave that to you, Betsy. But I want you to see this. This is quite amazing. Because this is the gospel that Paul said. Also in Romans 10.9, it says that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and confess Him as your Lord, you shall be saved. What do I have to believe? That God sent His Son, okay, and that He raised Him from the dead after He bore my sins. And that if I believe that and confess him as Lord with my mouth, I shall be saved. Why is that? Because here's the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel 
I preach to you what you have received, right? And on which you have taken your stand. Now watch this. By this gospel, you are saved. Anybody see that word after that? It's, 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 it's an amazing word because it's conditional. People don't preach it as if there's, that once you're saved, you're saved. If, 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 you what? Hold fast or hold what? In other words, you hang on to what you believe. You don't give up. Paul said, I press on. I'm pressing on to the higher calling of my Lord. Jesus said it this way. I'm the vine. You're the branch. Stay connected to me or you're going to die. You're going to wither. See, that's what Jesus and the apostles preached. And America isn't being preached that today. And those men are teaching a false doctrine that's going to possibly bring incredible judgment upon them. But the gospel, but by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Oh, boy, they're thinking, who's got those parchments? We better go back over it. It's so hard to find parchments today, but there's Bibles everywhere gathering dust. Otherwise, you believed in vain. Amen. Now watch this. You know, it's amazing today. Just leave that up there. Isaiah 66, 2. This is whom I look to, says the Lord. Those who are broken and contrite in spirit and those who tremble at my word. Tremble at your word? Lord, we all love ice cream. We all love candy. We all love to be encouraged. I'm, why do I? I'm not going to tremble at your word. It's the good news, Jesus. You know what I mean? Well, there's some trembling here when he says, hey, you know, you have to hold firm. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So there, there's the gospel. That's why it's so important, you know, for us that we believe in Jesus and we hold firmly to him. You know, um, people talk about, you know, sometimes you ask people or they'll share about who was the nicest person to them. And some say, you know, it was my grandma on my dad's side or, you know, it was my mom or, uh, you know, someone else that you connected to. And uh, sometimes people stay in touch as long as you can because they loved you. They reached out to you. They were kind to you. People who were happened to be there when, you know, something terrible happened in your life. And so you're bonded to them. And uh, that's a good thing. And, uh, but with the Lord, it's amazing. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't feel that way, Jesus. Bad things happen in the world. He says, but I warned you. I warned you. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. They'll hate you, you know. So don't, 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 don't forget. But you'll be blessed when they speak evil of you for my name's sake. But this, don't marvel that the world hates you. See, that's what he, John said. Jesus said it. Paul said, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So there we go. You know, for today, pretty much in America, uh, we're just mocked. We're not stoned. We're just mocked, you know, in, in many different forms. But it's our opportunity in this world. Throughout all the universe, this is the only planet that has Satan, a fallen human race, and a savior that came to this planet to be able to say to you, I have a way now, a way out. And it only depends. It, the biggest decision any person would ever make is what are you, what am I, what am I going to do about Jesus and what am I going to continue to do about Jesus if he died on the cross, if he died that agonizing death and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father in heaven but through me. Okay, what am I going to do about it? Well, you say, well, I gave my life to the Lord when I was a five-year-old little girl. 
Um, I gave my heart to the Lord in a Baptist church on the corner when I was a little boy down in wherever, Detroit or whatever. That's great. That's great. But we're talking about today. We're talking about right now. Now that we know these things, how are we embracing? What are we doing to hold on to God? In a time, in trials, when sometimes life is not fair and it seems like the Lord is not ever present. Why did this happen? Boy, we've all, we all can write our list down. But he, here's the deal. This is the only time you will be able to overcome evil. If we all go to heaven, you'll never have to deal with it again. But it's how you, as it were, obey. Are you ready? The first commandment. Now, I can't quite remember what it says. Give me your this or give me that. Or say this or say that. Or jump up and down, spin around, do that. No, I think it says, I want you to love me with all your heart. But John said, praise God, 1 John 4. We love him because he first loved us. He said the verse before, he says, we have come to experience and realize and rely on the love that God has for us. When Christ, here's the thing, when Christ begins to be formed in you, he begins to start taking over. It all determines how much do we yield, how much do we surrender. Well, this tragedy in my life, Lord, you allowed it, I don't get it. Just get on your knees and say, help me. What am I supposed to do? Get on your knees and say, Jesus, help me. Now, why would I say that? Because Jesus said something that's amazing. He said, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. Now, the Greek, some of the better Greek actually says, come unto me when you're totally burnt out and exhausted. That's some of what it says. But he said, come and learn about me. Okay, well, what? What do you want? I'm hurt, and I feel like you've forsaken me. What do you want, Lord? I want you to learn of me. Okay, yeah, okay, you're God. I get it. That isn't what he said there. Did he? Did he? He said, I want you to come and learn that I'm gentle, tenderhearted. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, because that's exactly what you need. I've got to get rid of that bitterness. I get to get, I got to get rid of that religion. I had a, a grandfather on my mom's side, and uh, even when I was like twenty, working. If he saw me, he'd always come up and slip me five or ten dollars. Always would, and if he didn't, my grandmother would. Now. In those days, that was a little more money than today, believe me. It's like 40 years, over four. It was before I, Pam and I were even, even met. But he, here's the deal. Is, is that I always knew they loved me. In you, there is an ability inside of you because you now have his spirit to know basically this, that he loves you. It's available. But I found it to be, I found it personally to be painful. Just before we went, I was in the ministry, my mother died, and it was over a two and a half year period of time. It was not pretty. Okay? I kept thinking she was going to be healed. She wasn't. Okay? So there's always stumbling blocks along the way. Darn. Painful. But I found out Jesus is nice. He's kind, and he is not religious, and he is not the way a lot of people paint him. He is, is love. God is love. First thing it says about love, oh, let's see. Love is, do you remember 1 Corinthians? Patient. Love is kind. That's exactly what you need is someone to be patient with you when you're uptight and ticked off at God. You need somebody who's patient. Oh, you really do. Not short-tempered. 
like everybody else around you, or they might be. You know, you know when you're acting like a jerk and you think you're right and everybody's wrong? You know what I mean. We've all been there. Hey, here's the bottom line. Here's what I'm telling you, though. I am not religious. I don't want my kids to be religious. I don't think I was ever religious around them. But I do know this. He loves his children. And I do know this, that he must impart what he requires of you. Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me, you cannot do a darn thing. That is for God with eternal purposes, to love God, to forgive those who have hurt you, to forgive yourself, and to basically be totally gut honest with Jesus and say, I feel you've let me down. Everybody's been there. Everybody's had something like that. And it, unfortunately, sometimes it lasts a long time. I don't like it either. You're in a fallen world. In heaven, it'll never happen. It is not God. It's the devil. It's our own sinfulness. It's the sinfulness of other peoples. It's the self-will. We live in a fallen world. Don't forget. But in heaven, it'll never be an issue because it'll never be allowed. Only down here do we have trials and tribulation because there's two races, one in darkness and one in light. And believe me, they're not getting along, and it's going to get even worse. But here's the deal. Because he lives inside of me and because his resurrection power is available to us, not only are you going to make it, not only are you going to squeak by, you are called to be a leader, every one of you. A leader of what? Leading people out of darkness into light. And the, the, the very, you know, anybody that's really, look, if you ever go to war, you want to go to somebody who's been in battle and has been trained and has gone through the boot camp and every elite training after that. That's who you are. You're going through the boot camp of life. You say, well, you know, I'm just a woman. You're in it anyway. Some of you women have had to overcome much worse things than a lot of people, depending on where you live, where you grew up. But those who forgive much experience the love of God. There's nothing in this world that can take you down unless you submit to it. Because the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is for us who believe. We look around today, it's discouraging. Did you happen to see the front page? I get the L.A. Times on Sunday, okay? I'll just tell you the truth. I saw a bunch of African-American women. They were marching because a young boy, 12 years old, who had been beaten many times by gang members, was finally shot and killed. I don't like that. I don't like that. That's in my city, right? said he had, had to run many times before. He was getting beat up and stuff. 12-year-old kid. Well, he's in heaven, I'm sure. That boy's, that boy's, he can't believe how awesome it is. But I, I hate things like that. I hate what's going on in Syria. I hate what's going on in our nation in many areas. So it could get me sour. But I look to him. Draw me, Jesus, into your divine nature. Help me respond to these situations. As a Christian, born from above, receiving and being imparted the very life and nature and wisdom, hopefully, and power and authority and faith and love to be able to pray heaven down upon this earth. Let's stand up. That precious little boy's life got the city stirred up. Those women, God's going to hear their prayers. I guarantee you that, bro. Man, he's going to hear the prayers. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you who God hears prayers of. He hears prayers of mothers, man. People tell me, well, it was my grandmother. That's how we became Christians. Staying with somebody last week, he said, well, had to be my grandmother. We were the only, she was the only one we knew even prayed. Anybody have, have a grandmother like that? Well, she was your Billy Graham. I guarantee you that. So, Lord, um, here we are. It's, they call it Easter. We call it, man, 
Great job, Jesus. Raised from the dead. Hallelujah. That's one song we sang about it was sure help me praise God. But here they are, Lord. Um, these are these are your awesome kids. Hey, Lord, I guess you know it, but you gave them resurrection life, resurrection power. Some of them may have stumbled in here today. But you you had a word for them. You you love them and you're commissioning some of them. Eventually, every one of them. Because they have the words of life. And I pray, Lord, that uh, they take one big serious look at your cross, your death, your burial, your resurrection again. We could put a real guilt trip and say, ah, none of you are living worthy of the cross. Well, we can say that, but we can say this. Jesus, he'll help you be a good boy and girl. He'll help you make your parents proud if they knew the Lord. He'll, he'll make wrong that second grade teacher who said you weren't smart. You know, we had to wear dunce caps when I was a kid. Yeah, it was terrible. I didn't have to wear it, praise God, but <laughs> but I, I never I never did feel good about it. I just I thought that's terrible. What's a dunce? It's like a word that was beyond me in second grade. But you had to wear it. You had to sit in the corner. It was a big crazy hat, dunce cap. Yeah. Anyway, we survived. So, Lord, um, I ask you to help them with their pain and their disappointments. I ask you to bear our pain and our sorrows on the cross. I ask you to invade our hearts. You know, um, can you g bring the band up again? I want to sing that one song on the cross. I forget. It was like the fourth song or something. Where is, are, are you guys here? Yeah. I don't remember which one it was, but it was on the cross, right? That one. There were, yeah, several good ones, but. That one about his resurrection and all that. But uh, I want you just to pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, let it be done unto me according to your word. Mary said, how can this happen to me? And Gabriel said to her, don't worry about it, baby. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. And that holy thing inside of you is the Son of God. Yeah. You're going to be a temple of the Holy Ghost. That's who you are. So, Lord, bless these men and women today as we sing this song. Thank you, Jesus, for being the Holy Lamb of God.